Good morning, everyone. My name is Vicki Allingrod, and I am the Senior Associate Dean in the College of Pharmacy, as well as the Education Lead within Precision Health. Today, we are kicking off our first webinar series that's designed to connect clinicians and healthcare professionals with some of the key concepts necessary to understanding the role of learning health sciences, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all in clinical care. It's called demystifying the data, process, and tools that are changing clinical care. Before we begin with our speakers today, I wanted to provide you with some information about Precision Health in case you are not that familiar. Two of the key aspects to Precision Health are serving as a facilitator of research as well as financially supporting Precision Health work. For facilitating research, Precision Health has built infrastructure to enable interdisciplinary research by providing tools and resources across the entire U of M campus. If this is something that interests you, I highly recommend that you become familiar with our analytics platform, which was developed to help researchers from all disciplines and all levels access and use Precision Health data. For funding research, Precision Health also realizes the importance of encouraging research, not only through educational events like this one, but with real research dollars. Therefore, I'm happy to announce that currently nearly six and a half million dollars in research have already been distributed for promising uh, projects as well as trainees here on campus. However, research that doesn't make its way into the clinic cannot change clinical practice and Precision Health realizes the importance of translating findings into practice. Therefore, the Precision Health Implementation Workgroup has been doing just that with some of the most recent findings from this work also being highlighted on the Precision Health webpage. And lastly, education. Each year we have provided to the U of M community and beyond opportunities to learn more about Precision Health through webinars like this one, symposiums not only for our own researchers here on campus, but for our participants within some of our research projects. And more recently, a first in the nation Precision Health Certificate Program, which is open to graduate and professional students across campus. We are currently enrolling students into the program for the winter semester, and later on, one of our speakers is gonna be giving you more information about that program. So I hope I, with this information, I have enticed you to learn more about Precision Health. And in order to do so, I would like to encourage you to become a member and visit the Precision Health website where more information can be found. More importantly, as I mentioned, you, be, you can become a member. And if you're interested in that, we have over 220 members now, and they are all able to use our resources, get communication, uh, support to publicize their work, and have other benefits as well. Therefore, please go and visit the Precision Health website to apply and learn more about everything that we do. For our speakers today, we are gonna have two speakers and then uh, following, when they are done with their presentation, we're gonna have a question and answer period. You can submit questions in the chat box at any time during this webinar, and then we will be reading your questions um, for our speakers to answer. As I previously mentioned, today we're kicking off our first webinar that is part of a series designed to connect clinicians and healthcare professionals with the concepts of a learning health system, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. I'm very excited about this program and so glad that many of you are interested in learning more about this, this webinar series. This program was developed in collaboration with Dr. Cornelius James from Michigan Medicine as well as in collaboration with our Precision Health Education Workgroup members. Our plan is to provide a webinar every month with the goal of having an in-person symposium in the fall. Today though, we are excited to host our two outstanding speakers who will give perspectives on how data science, learning health systems, and precision health can enhance clinical practice. I want to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Gretchen Payat, who is an associate professor in the learning health sciences at the University of Michigan Medical School. Within that department, she serves as associate chair for educational programs 
as well as the graduate chair for the Health Infrastructures and Learning Systems Master's PhD program. And she is director of the Precision Health Graduate uh, Certificate Program. She has expertise in designing, implementing, and evaluating community interventions aimed at improving healthcare delivery in ethnic minority and underserved populations with diabetes. Our second speaker, speaker is Dr. Rachel Richardson, who is a professor in learning health sciences at the University of Michigan Medical School. She conducts original research on the quality and usability of data from electronic health records for research and has fostered many interdisciplinary research collaborations. She has directed implementation of data standards for national, multinational, multi-site clinical research and epidemiological studies for the NIH, her core, and other agencies. Dr. Richardson currently leads the Electronic Health Record Core for the NIH Health Systems Research Collaboratory, which is developing standards and quality metrics for clinical phenotyping using EHR data in pragmatic clinical trials. And with that, I would like to thank both of you for participating in our webinar today. Thank you, Vicki, uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak today and to share with all of you how data science, learning health systems, and precision health can really enhance clinical practice. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Dr. Gretchen Pyatt. I'm the Associate Chair for Educational Programs in the Department of Learning Health Sciences, and I'll be joined today by my colleague, uh, Dr. Rachel Richardson, uh, who is a national expert in data standards and learning health systems. Uh, next slide, please. So in today's webinar, we have really four main points I'd like to cover. Uh, these include a discussion of the concept of learning health system and uh, how it applies to clinical practice. Um, we're then going to move into um, a conversation about opportunities and limitations of current data infrastructure and implications of using the EHR to support practice change. We then wanna make sure that you gain an understanding of the dimensions of data quality and possible metrics for assessing data quality. And then finally, we'd like to share with you some information about the Precision Health Certificate Program. Uh, and this would really be uh, an opportunity for all of you to develop your skills and capabilities in this area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So I'd like to start off by introducing you to Ms. Hall. Ms. Hall has been coming to your clinic, uh, for example, for about 10 years now. And she just turned 51 and she and her husband live in Ypsilanti. Uh, she's been a grandma now for about three years and her daughter and grandchildren actually just moved in with um, her and her husband after her daughter lost her job. So in between her childcare duties as a grandma, um, Ms. Hall continues her job as a postal worker and she remains active in her church. And you know that Ms. Hall has diabetes, hypertension, and she was recently diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. And you also know based on years of seeing her that she struggled with her glycemic control for some time now. So today, she presents in clinic um, with increased fatigue, nausea, and she just noticed that her feet and ankles seem to be swollen. So I want you to think about what your treatment plan would be here. If you just consider those items in that yellow box. And I want you to compare and contrast your plan to what's here in the white box. How do we make this jump from what's in the yellow box, these facts that we know, and what your treatment plan in your mind was, to a more comprehensive patient plan? And the answer, in my opinion anyway, um, lies within learning health systems, and more specifically, data science and precision health. Um, so 
we go from what's in that yellow box to what's in that white box. So we know that Ms. Hall presents with fatigue and nausea and swollen feet and, or ankles. And really in, when we're thinking with a learning health systems approach, you're trying to understand her limiting factors, including her social determinants of health and her treatment preferences. You know, you're searching the literature for evidence of nausea and fatigue and swelling as possible symptoms of decreased kidney functioning. And you're looking from data or looking for data from your institution and others um, on other patients like Ms. Hall. But the kicker here is that you're doing that at the point of care. <clears throat> you then go on to implement a treatment plan, communicate it to the care team. You follow up regularly um, with the care team and, and Ms. Hall and her family, and you adjust accordingly. New data about Ms. Hall's symptoms are then generated. You're generating that data um, and they're stored and they're reported on monthly. And you learn from Ms. Hall. Uh, you publish in the scientific literature and you share your evidence with your colleagues, allowing them to learn from you in order to help their patients like Ms. Hall. And while the items in the white box are largely aspirational with the right infrastructure in place, including data and standards, it is totally possible to achieve. Next slide, please. And that infrastructure comes in the form, like I mentioned, of a learning health system. So in its most simplistic form, a learning health system collects data to generate knowledge and then apply that data to improve practice. <clears throat> so we think of a learning health system as a health system in which outcomes and experience are continually improved by applying science, informatics, incentives, and culture to generate and use knowledge in the delivery of care. And we know that through use of a learning health system, we can also improve value, reduce unjustified variation, support research, and enhance workforce education, training, and performance. And the framework here on the right really represents just key challenges facing anyone building a learning health system or taking a learning health systems approach to their work. So in clinical settings, the learning cycle, which is right there in the center with where you see the arrows, um, it begins with the generation of a research question called from interactions between patients, clinicians, system leaders, and researchers. So if you think back to Ms. Hall, that research question was, well, does, does swollen ankles or swollen feet have anything to do with decreased kidney functioning? So oftentimes we refer to that group of, of patients and clinicians and system leaders, et cetera, um, who we start talking to within the structure of a learning health system we call that a learning community. Um, new knowledge is then generated through LHS research. It's integrated into biomedical network, into the biomedical knowledge network and scaled to patients, um, taking into consideration the unique needs of each person and their local system and community contexts. Next slide, please. So when we think a bit more about this structure of a learning health system, you know, the fractal nature of any learning health system means that conceptually, many of the challenges are the same, regardless of whether the system is at the local level, the regional level, the national level, or the international level. People and systems and organizations are all experiencing the same types of challenges. And you can see some of these challenges as you look in the different um, blocks, so to speak, that go around um, the circle there in the framework. We know that there's unique and complex systems of technologies, people, and policies, um, all with common inf infrastructural elements 
that make up this learning health systems approach. Uh, next slide, please. So when we dig into the center of that learning health system where we saw those arrows, there's the cyclical building blocks that really provide the infrastructure that's so, so important uh, in propagating a cycle of continuous learning. So first, data must be generated from practice. So this is the green arrow here or the practice to data section of the cycle. The data has to be captured, it has to be stored, accessed and protected. And the quality of the data must be ensured and it must be shareable and understood between the settings. So then as we continue um, through the cycle, uh, when we go into the next arrow, you know, the, in the blue arrow, knowledge must be generated from the data. And we call this section of the cycle, the data to knowledge um, uh, section. And there's many, many ways to generate knowledge. So in clinical practice, one of the most common ways is through the randomized controlled trial. But there's also a range of quasi-experimental study designs and um, different analytical methods that also generate knowledge. So um, methods including things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, engineering approaches, and even qualitative methods there, these are all ways in which knowledge is generated. So as we talk about knowledge and as we generate knowledge, we get into the red uh, section of the cycle where knowledge then must be put into practice or we call this section the knowledge to practice section. Um, and you know, it's, it's not enough to just publish knowledge in books and, and journals and reports it must be put into practice um, where all of you can actually use it. So clinical guidelines, for instance, um, can be represented in a standardized machine readable and computable form that can guide decision-making at the front line. That's just one example of how we put knowledge into practice. So where we really wanna focus on today though, is the data to knowledge section of the cycle or that blue arrow. And once data are consistently obtained in a standardized and analyzable form, such as data from an uh, electronic health record, they then must be used to derive knowledge. And too often, I think as we are all very, very aware of, Health systems collect reams and reams of data, but they tend to lack the means of converting them into reproducible, generalizable knowledge. So with that, I wanna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Rachel Richardson, who's going to focus uh, the majority of her talk on that blue section of the cycle. Thanks so much, Gretchen, I appreciate that. And, and let me just start again, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about the data. And this is foundational to all the parts of the cycle that you mentioned. And it's hard to imagine how we can even have data science without data. But, but really data isn't useful unless we have some level of understanding about where it came from and what its limitations are and how it connects to other pieces of data and information. And as we increase our understanding of data and its connectiveness to other uh, other sources, then we can begin to understand relationships, patterns, and then principles to really apply uh, knowledge generated from data into practice. Next slide. So where do we start? Well, electronic health records uh, systems and data are, are the foundation of our health system and of, uh, obviously a logical place to, to, to start in terms of, uh, of data for, for learning health cycles. But what do we typically have in the EHR? Most EHRs have these types of data and not much beyond this, this type of data, and there's different levels of standardization. If we um, select TINA Advanced to Diagnoses, uh, we do have diagnoses and they're coded in a code system called ICB-9, or I'm sorry, it's ICB-10 CM now. And if you go ahead and click, uh, this tweet says it all. I, I, I saw this just recently. Um, a physician asked, why is there one ICD-10 code for pelvic pain uh, that covers so many different diagnoses and structures. Like it covers 28 different conditions and we wonder why women's health research is limited. 
As a comparison, there are a myriad of codes for various falls, off a cliff, off a tree, off a chair, off a stair, off a bed. Um, so there are different levels of, of granularity and precision in different parts of, of the code system. And there's a historical uh, reasons for that. But, but this really translates into um, challenges and um, some complexity in terms of using these codes uh, at different points in the cycle that we have. If we move forward, the notion of a computable phenotype really illustrates this, this well. Uh, of these many granular codes, for example, diabetes, there's dozens of codes for diabetes, um, and certain ones have, have certain meanings depending on the type of population or patient that you're trying to identify. So this notion of a computable phenotype is actually a formalized definition of different types of data and um, value sets that you might find within an EHR. So in the example of diabetes, you might have a definition that's a combination of inpatient or outpatient diagnosis codes. It may have some time periods to it. Um, and then there will also likely be criteria about uh, lab codes or medication codes that might indicate the type of uh, patient or uh, population that you're looking for but none of this is perfect. But uh, the, the point is there's a lot of work that goes into constructing this type of definition. And there's some validation that needs to be performed at each site to make sure that the definition you're defining works for what the purpose um, that you design it for is. And so there are many opportunities to share this if you'll advance to the next slide. One platform, which honestly hasn't gotten a huge amount of uptake because I think there's just some uh, the motivation is not necessarily there. And I think the value, if people haven't um, come to realize the value of sharing these kinds of definitions and having a consistency in the definition that you're using to develop an intervention, uh, to evaluate that intervention, and then to share that with the world and then reapply it. But there, there really is great value in understanding the details of a definition that's used to identify a patient population and then sharing that. And this phenotype knowledge base or PKB um, is supported by Vanderbilt University. And it emerged from a research, a genetic research network called the Emerge Network. Uh, and there's probably a hundred different uh, condition definitions on here and uh, a mechanism for people to share their definitions and then to download and potentially share feedback and have some community discussion about those. So this is a resource I think uh, folks should look into and it might inspire things that we might do internally along the same vein of having a, a communication um, and potential for sharing and reusing these computable phenotypes that identify that the patients that we're looking to, to um, uh, intervene and improve healthcare for. Next slide. Other types of EHR data, if you'll advance in addition to diagnoses, we have problems. Uh, it's important to notice that there is a standard for problems. Uh, there's actually two. They might be coded in ICD-10 or they might be coded in SNOMED. Uh, and not every problem would make it on a problem list. Um, the, these are need to be curated uh, organizationally and it takes time in a clinical visit to remove things that might have resolved um, and then to, to, to add new things. So this is a challenge for every organization to maintain this problem list. And, and people should be aware as you look at that kind of data, that there may be things that are missing or there may be problems that are in other places of record. And also that not every problem on a problem list is necessarily a problem. You might see uh, family history items or reference to um, surgical procedures that need follow-up that would sort of expire, if you will. Um, and conditions such as pregnancy would be on a problem list, but not necessarily considered a problem by all. So there's, there's uh, an importance to understand where these data come from, how complete they are, and, and how well they are. Are curated. We also have procedures uh, in our EHR data, and these tend to be medical billable procedures, and there's a standardized coding system uh, for those as well. So as you use these data, you're limited to what is available to be coded in that system. There are also laboratory tests uh, and values. Again, various levels of granularity. Our reference standard uh, terminology for lab tests called LOINC actually has 800 different codes for different types of glucose tests. And so it's important to understand what those mean and how they can be clinically aggregated um, in a way that makes sense for, for patients. And again, this information can be shared and reused so that not everyone is reinventing the wheel each time. There's also family history data. 
um, in EHRs, and this may be in a contained, it modularized in a particular form with very structured questions, or this may actually appear on a problem list or in our notes um, uh, in reports. And, and finally, I just wanted to highlight that we have reports, structured data from, from reports, um, may be institutionally specific, so it may be difficult to, to um, compare these across organizations, but there's some level of structure often to reports, but the clinical notes, which many have estimated cover 80 to 90% of the good stuff or what, what you might want uh, to know about a, a patient or uh, um, for, for care or potential research are in these clinical notes. And later talks in the series, we'll talk about strategies and tools for extracting that information from clinical notes so that we can use it for different types of physician health activities. Next slide. So if we think briefly, I will highlight just a little more detail than Gretchen provided on where data fits into these different uh, uh, cycles and the activities around them. So first using data to knowledge for discovery. Certainly data can be used and is, is critical to hypothesis driven research and identifying patients for trials, describing their baseline characteristics, describing populations and perhaps the outcomes. Uh, and data can also be used as Gretchen highlighted for more exploratory um, uh, types of research, data-driven uh, research and inductive research. Uh, as we move to treatment, data is critically important in how we might move interventions into practice, as Gretchen had mentioned, is the critical point. And to do that at scale, we could really use these um, uh, electronic health record systems and, um, and automate, if you will, the right piece of information to the right provider at the right point in care. But to do this, we need data that is very, very precise and specific to the patient. If we don't, we run the risk of having decision support alerts or info buttons or all different formats that we could use for decision support. But if they're not relevant to the patient that you have and they're not specific to the patient that the clinician is looking at at that time, then they're going to be very likely to dismiss those alerts and perhaps dismiss future alerts that, that are very important. So, so having a quality and a very high level of specificity and completeness of data or good data is, is critical for thinking about how we can use EHR systems to deliver automated decision support, as well as how they can be used to uh, coordinate care between different providers on the care team. So this, this, this shared approach to the patient care and its personalized approach requires uh, sharing information among providers in a way that they can use it at the point of time that they need that information. And also the patient as part of their, of their care team, right, as a driving member of their care team. As we start thinking about patient portals and how we can deliver um, and share information with patients, we can also share guidelines and even automated uh, tools and messages for, for health promotion uh, and, and prevention uh, and so again, the data is very critical for these. But as we roll these out, if you'll advance the next slide, we need to think about, are we capturing the kinds of data that we need to even evaluate and monitor this type of automated decision support, broad, broadly defined, uh, but are we capturing whether someone received it, whether they read it, um, is it useful? Um, are we uh, capturing exactly what providers and patients are doing in response to those messages and what was actually delivered in standard of care? And it's not clear that we really do this in all of our electronic record systems beyond capturing what is absolutely needed for the, for the conduct of that visit and, and, and the generation of the bill many times. It's not clear that we're getting the level of detail that we need. So these are things that people need to think about as you're using data or if you're in a position to be uh, augmenting these these systems for precision health. And then finally, the evaluation criteria, these data feed right into the evaluation. And is that evaluation, does it reflect what's important to patients? Are we doing a patient-centered evaluation and including things such as patient-reported functioning and, and outcomes? Um, and are we also capturing what different members of that clinical care team think? Um, and then finally, are we looking at different populations and vulnerable populations and seeing how they might respond differently to the different interventions or programs or treatments that we're, we're looking at, and then are we um, creating or perpetuating health disparities in that? And that all depends on data. And before I advance, I want you to think just for a minute what the implications of bad data or incomplete data um, could be at any point in this cycle. Um, for example, if you don't collect race completely, how can you determine the impact of the standard of practice or new intervention on different uh, race and uh, 
uh, ethnic groups. Uh, what about gender identity? If you don't collect it, you cannot evaluate it. But more importantly, what if you have data that's missing, not at random? What if you're collecting outcomes on your intervention on patients and you're doing this through a patient portal and part of your populations, perhaps African-Americans might use it less, older patients might use the portal, yes, less, younger patients might use it less, sick patients might lose, use it less. So if you're collecting uh, feedback from, um, from, from, your, from your population, your patient population, and you're not doing that consistently, you're gonna have incomplete data and you can actually perpetuate uh, uh, errors and bias in your analysis. So if we'll move forward, that transitions us nicely into this idea of data quality and what is data quality. We all talk about it, we know it's important, but there are actually um, a, a, a fair amount of complexity to this. I'll point people that are interested to this uh, article by Nicole Weisskopf and Chunhua Wang um, in uh, 2013, which is really a seminal article on data quality. They surveyed the literature and looked at how people were using the terms and what, out, what measures that they were using to assess data quality. And they came up with five themes of uh, completeness, correctness, concordance, plausibility, and currency. And on the screen, you'll see synonyms for those, for those themes. But these were the dimensions that they, from the literature, de defined and developed. And if you'll move forward, those same uh, five dimensions of data quality each have different types of measures, if you'll advance. Um, and, and there are many different approaches to measuring these, but first is sort of defining each of these six areas, or these five areas on the left and then different approaches. The most common, but the most resource intensive is to compare the data to a gold standard, which might be an expert opinion or an opinion of a panel of experts, which you can imagine will be uh, a very uh, resource intensive uh, to create. But there's other measures to look at completeness um, and correctness as well, such as agreement of different data elements, um, agreement with another source of data, comparing distributions from other data sources, and, and that can be used to uh, to test a number one of the a number of these dimensions of data quality, uh, but this just sort of gives you an idea of the methods used, um, and the article describes a little bit the, the pros and cons of each. So I would direct folks to this article and move forward, and I'll just highlight their con their conclusions in this article, where that data quality can be measured either directly or by proxy, most often by proxy, uh, but we need a consistent taxonomy of EHR data quality so that we're all talking about the same thing and we can develop best practices around that. But the main point is that data quality is truly task dependent, um, uh, and, and so it really depends on what you're doing and that there's a need for research in this area. So as we think about learning and we think about precision health and the work of our two communities moving forward, we can also think about how to improve our science and our practice to ensure that we have the best quality data to address all pieces of this cycle. You'll move forward to the next slide. Uh, those same um, uh, principles, those same dimensions of data quality and those different um, possible measures have been adopted and used by many, many different research networks and initiatives. In particular, the FDA's program for real world evidence relies heavily on the use of real world data of which EHR data is one type. So they've developed some guidelines that use many of these, um, the concepts from that, that seminal uh, article that I mentioned. Also the NIH Collaboratory for Pragmatic Clinical Trials. This is a project that, that I work on. We've developed some data quality assessment guidelines looking at that exhaustive work from uh, Weisskopf and Wang, but trying to um, consolidate down to something a little more uh, manageable. So if you move to the next slide, I'll just highlight in this particular case for these types of studies, these pragmatic clinical trials embedded within practice, we um, as, a, as a coordinating center identified three key dimensions that were important for the critical variables for the study. So for the key selection variables or outcome variables, we recommend that researchers perform a data quality assessment that looks specifically at the completeness of the data, the accuracy or the correctness was the um, uh, synonym, or inconsistency, and then we give several examples of the type of assessment methods that may be used, but of course it depends on the data and the, the specifics of the, the, the data and the research question, but this is some level of guidance, um, as well as we suggested that they look qualitatively at the data flows at each place and understand what that provenance of the data is. So if you move forward, just to summarize, data quality really is all about purpose, and there is uh, it can be very intensive, uh, resource intensive, and time consuming to assess and improve data quality and make a plan to do that. 
And there is some sweet spot where there is um, uh, sort of you want the minimum level of effort, effort and the maximum of value of that. And, and that varies by study. Uh, if we move to the next slide, again, I'll just want to, on the types of EHR data, if you'll advance once more, Tina, I want people to think for a moment and take a minute to write into the chat. What types of data do we need for patient-centered care and precision health? And what are we missing here? And as you're, as you're thinking about this, I'll go ahead and uh, we'll advance to the next. The things that I see that are missing coming from a school of nursing, uh, you know, nursing data, you know, it may be in flow charts, but there's not necessarily a consistency or ease of getting that data out, as well as information that's coming from physical therapists and occupational therapists and other members of the care team. Functioning and quality of life, patient preferences, social determinants of health, uh, demographics, these are all things that I'm, that I'm seeing in the, it being entered in the chat now, and they're critically important um, for, for precision health. And so we need to think about those data that they're missing. How are we going to collect those data and how are we going to collect them in a high quality way? We move to the next slide. Uh, I want to make one comment and really underscore this. Um, uh, this is from, from a patient, uh, and you can um, search under Mighty Casey uh, on Twitter. She gave me permission to use this, and in fact, this is her statement of uh, patient preferences are not captured in EHRs in a way uh, that's reliable uh, or consistent. So this is a, a, a drastic, uh, resp extreme response, but it really illustrates how important it is uh, that patients have their ability to express their preferences and that that gets documented in a way that can be accessed by anyone on the care team uh, at, the, at the time that's needed. And it, beyond uh, just preferences for care or end of life care, uh, there are many opportunities and uh, points where, by which patient reported information uh, should and could be part of, part of this process of precision health. Next slide, please. So all this, uh, there are some examples that we can look toward as we move towards what is a dream, the idea of learning health systems and all these learning cycles and precision health and, and um, uh, driving um, uh, improvements uh, for, for patients' uh, experience and outcomes. But there are a few examples that we can look toward. For example, uh, Geising, or I'm sorry, the green button. So this idea of a data science consult, uh, an informatics consult at the point of care where a clinician can actually hit a button, if you will, and a data scientist um, might figuratively come down running to the room or, or, or soon after that visit, aggregate data so that in places where there aren't clear guidelines, a clinician and a patient and a care team could together look at data of patients like them and see what would make the most sense for the healthcare decision that they were facing now. And the notion of this is a green button. It's been published for a few years and Stanford University is actually doing this. They've done, they've reported on uh, close to 100 of these, these consults that are happening at or near the point of care. And so it's an interesting and exciting paradigm shift that, that we could we could imagine and look into as we move forward. Next slide. Also, I wanted to just highlight Geisinger Health System has had a long uh, history and commitment to genomic medicine and the return of um, genetic uh, information and results to patients. And so that's an organization we're looking toward. And more importantly, if we move to the next slide, as they've been rolling this out, they've had actually a very uh, rigorous framework to evaluate that, that includes uh, patient outcomes and clinician outcomes and patient perceptions um, uh, as, as well. So, so there's a strong evaluation uh, component to that that they've been that they've developed and are working uh, to, toward implementing and is, is generating quite a bit of information we might look toward. Next slide. And finally, I want to highlight uh, there are many of these um, it, it, uh, happily enough to report there are this is a growing, uh, trend, the idea where it's more patient engaged uh, research and care community. And so I want to highlight Improved Care Now, which um, actually began with patients in a registry and patient reported information on children with um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome and starting with the data of what patients were feeling and experiencing and questions they had, they then combined electronic health record data. And, and continue to look at it with patients involved and have actually demonstrated changes, not only in our research knowledge, there certainly have been publications that have scientific publications that have come from this community, but they have also uh, demonstrated improved patient outcomes through this process of looking at data 
applying new changes and evaluating those in these cycles. So I would direct people to look at improved care now uh, for an example of, of something that's working well that really is engaging patients um, in advancing both research and clinical care. And so with that inspiration, I'll point to uh, and just highlight again, these great um, resources that we have here at University of Michigan uh, Precision Health. Um, we're well poised, I think, um, to advance the visions of both precision health and learning health systems um, to improve our generation and dissemination of knowledge. First, the resource, research uh, resources that were mentioned, the, the MyPART study and the bio repository and really the targeting of underrepresented populations that we're doing now um, is very exciting. The, the resources, including the analytic platform and the, the, PH, uh, the data direct tools, I think are a great resource uh, for, for researchers and clinicians to understand and improve what's going on. Uh, but most exciting, I think, is the community aspects of this. Um, this is just such a huge opportunity to pull people together from all across the university to really um, uh, help uh, identify how we can use data at each part of the cycle, moving from uh, data to knowledge, to knowledge to practice, to practice back to data. Um, and so the, the road to this uh, dream of precision health is as much about uh, collaboration and communication as it is about data. Uh, and education plays a, a, a tremendous role in this too. So with that, I'll move to Gretchen who can talk a little bit about uh, some of the initiatives that we're doing to, to advance our education and understanding in this area. Uh, thanks, Rachel. <clears throat> so, you know, one of the things that uh, we're all very focused on is actually training a workforce and developing a workforce in this area. And, you know, in general, there's not a ton of educational opportunities um, at places outside of, of U of M uh, around these types of uh, components. So within the Department of Learning Health Sciences, uh, we offer educational programs in uh, health infrastructures and learning systems. And we offer both an MS and a PhD. Um, next slide, please. So for the, for the master's degree, we have both residential and online offerings. You could um, get a degree in as uh, short of time as 12 months um, if you're full-time. And then we offer a PhD as well in health infrastructures and learning systems. Uh, next slide, please. Also within our department, uh, as we talked uh, a, a little bit about at the very beginning of, the, of today's webinar, we do offer the Precision Health Certificate, which I'm sure many of you might have heard of or you, know, you may be interested in. Um, applications for the Precision Health Program are due December 1st for our winter 2022 cohort. Um, this is a Rackham Graduate School Certificate uh, and open to graduate students in all programs at the University of Michigan. And with that, uh, I'd like to just thank you and open it up to questions and discussion. Wow, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for your wonderful presentations today. I think you gave us a lot to talk about. Um, and so if you have any questions, please feel to put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, um, with that, I want to thank everyone for attending today um, and hope to see you next one, month at the next uh, webinar that is part of this series. Thank you all again.